Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, Matt is going to walk us through some um, birds of the, the Northeast Ohio location, but I'm imagining that uh, these birds are all throughout uh, Ohio maybe, and maybe even in Massachusetts if you're joining us from there. So uh, Matt is going, to, he's with the Audubon Society and he is just gonna give us a presentation today. So take it away, Matt. Thanks a lot, Danielle. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, with the Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland, and uh, what I uh, what I have done since I retired in 2015 is take a whole bunch of my bird pictures and put together bird talks like the one I'm going to share with you today. I'm going to start sharing my screen here um, and get through the technology, and we have a little bit of sound, not too much, and I'll just rely on Danielle to tell me if this goes awry, but I'm going to um, go into my presenter view. Are we still okay, Danielle? Everything looks great. Okay, good. Now I want to get rid of me up here in the corner and move me out of the way. So the talk today is going to be about um, birds that are migrating through our area of Northeast Ohio today. And as she said, uh, this is uh, these birds are all over the country right now. Um, the waterfowl um, are doing very well as a group of birds. You may have heard that uh, we're down many, many species, uh, individuals of birds across the board. But the waterfowl, interestingly, are doing quite well. And it's primarily because the places where they go to breed are pretty remote, as you'll learn. And the places where they spend the winter are pretty much out in the open waters. So they're not subject to development as much as our songbirds are and things like that. So uh, we're gonna start here with the thing I start all of them out with is why should we even care about birds? And probably the main reason is because they're a great indicator of what's going on in the environment. We're all familiar with the expression canary in a coal mine. And if you are uh, of an age like me, uh, when you're born in the 1950s, you learned about the the uh, plight of the bald eagle and the peregrine falcon and many other birds of prey that succumb to uh, thin shells on their eggs because of the widespread use of DDT. It took a long time and a lot of political will to solve that problem, but the birds were the indicator that something was awry in, uh, in the environment. And the second reason, and there are many, many reasons, but the second one I think is because we need to bring beauty, wonder, and awe into our lives. And they certainly can do that if you'll just sort of put aside other things and, and go for it. A little bit for those of you who might be in Northeast Ohio, uh, quickly, some quick numbers here, and we don't belabor numbers in these talks too much, but if you were around here during the months of um, March, April, and May, what we call spring migration here, you could see potentially over 300 species of birds in Northeast Ohio. About 50 of them live here all year round and the rest are visitors that are either winter birds that are leaving and going north or um, summer birds that are coming up from the south all the way from Central and South America uh, and Southern United States up to our area. Uh, in the summer months of June and July, there could be possibly 260 species that can be found in our area. And in fall, the fall migration actually starts in August when birds from the Canadian Arctic, the shorebirds start to move south through our area, the sandpipers and uh, birds like that. And so during those four months from August through November, we'll see as many as 300 species of birds again, uh, if you were out there and able to see everyone and nobody can. Uh, and during the months right now that we're entering into uh, the winter months, there's a couple hundred species throughout Northeast Ohio. One, one of the reasons we have so many is uh, Northeast Ohio is bordered on the north by Lake Erie, and we have a lot of shorebirds and gulls, um, waterfowl that are up there. So it's quite a good birding spot, and I trust that no matter where you are, um, you have a lot of species of birds, more than what you think you see at your backyard feeders. So who are these waterfowl that are migrating through here? Well, they're birds that like to tolerate, I should say, cold weather. They thrive in it. And they're ducks and geese and swans. We even have some grebes, and you're going to learn about those, and loons. So those are the ones we're primarily going to talk about. And during the breeding season, they live way up north. So we start with uh, the upper Midwest states of the Dakotas, Minnesota, and so on, going up into some provinces of Canada. 
And that's what we call the pothole country. It, this is what it looks like if you were to fly over it. Uh, lots of water and lots of trees. And notice the green of the trees, primarily deciduous trees, trees that lose their leaves in, uh, in the wintertime. Going further north, uh, there's a segment where some of our these birds that we're talking about go that's called the boreal forest. And that's conifers, evergreens, spruces and pines and firs and things like that. Fly over that in a plane and it looks like this. You see more water again, but the trees are darker in color because they're conifers. And the last area that's uh, for some of our birds is that area in red, and that's the Arctic. And that's uh, an area that does defrost in the summertime. And it can look like this. You notice an absence of trees, but an abundance of water. And so one of the things that should come as no surprise then that what waterfowl eat, and I'm not gonna read this list to you, I'm gonna let you glance at it while I talk, um, it's quite varied. And it, are, it is uh, things that live in and around water and things that live on the land adjacent to water including everything from grass and leaves on the shore to um, insect larvae like uh, dragonfly larvae. If you've ever seen one of those, they're quite large. Um, amphibians of all kinds. And also when these birds start to migrate, they're going to go through big agricultural areas, uh, both in Canada and the upper Midwest. And there's lots of uh, grain that's left on the ground after the fields are harvested. And the waterfowl love to glean these, the ducks and the geese especially. Uh, they'll get in the fields and they'll just go to town eating wheat and soybeans and corn and things like that. Very nutritious for them. So we're going to start by talking about ducks and we group them into two groups, dabblers and divers. Um, dabblers are the ones that uh, you find typically in shallow water ponds where they can get up to the edges and either get uh, plant life or animal life. And again, when I talk about animal life, it's invertebrates primarily, things without a backbone, um, insect larvae, uh, <clears throat> fish, uh, small fish, and things like that that they'll eat as well. And the divers, they go deep. And some of them can go very deep, as much as 200 feet. And they'll eat fish. They'll eat um, uh, different shellfish down there, mollusks and things, and uh, snails. And, uh, and everything off the bottom too. So quite interesting group of fish or birds. So let's start with the dabblers and uh, see how this, if you can hear the sound here a little bit. We hear some spring peepers in the background. Uh, I live in what's called Geauga County, uh, Northeast Ohio. And this is one of our local parks that has a little bit of uh, wetland area. And this is typically what we see in the spring. Mallards starting to move through They've been here for the winter and be leaving soon, and they're dabbling. And we can hear a Wilson uh, snipe in the background too, willowing. So the mallard is probably the bird that most people are familiar with in the duck groups, the males and the females. They are at um, city ponds. Oftentimes, um, if you have a uh, catch basin for stormwater, you find them there. And the male's very characteristic. Uh, you can see its, it's uh, color combinations, pretty easy to remember. The female, and you'll see this in a slide later, blends in with all the other female ducks as being drab brown camouflage. And nature has seen fit to protect them as they sit on the nest, an open nest typically on the ground, uh, so that overhead prey uh, like hawks and eagles and stuff don't uh, see them as readily. Their babies uh, are quite cute, if you will. Uh, they don't get waterproof too much so they can look soggy wet uh, until they get a little bit older. Uh, this is the duck from which the domestic ducks that if you enjoy eating domestic duck, uh, they, were, uh, they came out of the mallard uh, gene pool. Uh, but the mallards are not afraid to hybridize. They do breed with other ducks. And here's a, a few pictures of what you can see. Let me get my laser pointer going here. Um, this light colored duck here on the left is probably a mallard and a white domestic duck cross. The one here in the middle, which is also the bird on the left over in this picture, is a mallard and American black duck cross. And we see characteristics of the black duck, which you'll see next, as well as the wing of the mallard. And this one, I don't know what the heck it is, but uh, we have a lot of them in this particular stormwater pond where I bird 
all the time in the winter time. It's just a great hot spot for finding birds. So they do hybridize. Uh, a lot of birds hybridize, and this one's very easy to break apart and see what they look like. The American black duck is about the size of a mallard, but uh, if you see it by itself, you're not sure if it's a female mallard or, uh, or a black duck until you get them together. So here is a female black duck. She's asleep along with a male. And here's an American black duck right here. The females um, are, of the mallards are much lighter. The black duck is real chocolatey brown. And it has this blue patch on the wing that is just blue. And if you look at mallards, they have that blue patch and there's a white bar on both sides. So those are distinguishing characteristics if you, are, uh, if you want to get into that detail. And I should say that I know there's a lot of different interests here. Some of you just enjoy the pretty pictures. So please uh, bear with my descriptions. I do that for those who are people who are getting into birding uh, or more serious birders to be sure I know what I'm talking about. And if I've made a mistake, please uh, put that in your chat and let me know. The next one is a really cool duck, the Northern Shoveler. And why? Because it's got this great big fat bill, real wide bill. Males, easy to tell um, its characteristic colors. The female, again, drab, but they've got these beautiful golden yellow eyes. And what they do that's kind of unique is they get into the shallow waters. Uh, they're actually standing in this water and they stir it all up with their feet. And then their bill has these lamina in them, these little sieves like, just kind of like the baleen on a whale. And they're able to slurp up uh, different plant life and animal life through their bill and squish out the water and then be able to swallow the good stuff that they can use that's nutritious. So that's really, uh, they stand out. These are pretty large ducks too and um, have some beautiful colors when they're flying. The, um, the gadwall is a, a pretty duck. I think it's understated elegance. That's my term, it's not from a book. Uh, what they're noted for uh, primarily is they're little pirates. They hang around diving ducks that go deep to get fish. And when the duck comes back up to the surface, these guys are waiting for them and they try to steal uh, what they've caught and eat it themselves. They like to uh, make their nests in ponds way up in Canada and hide in, uh, in the edges. And sometimes they like to go on islands, which is a real advantage so that they, the predators don't quite get to them. This is one of the few birds that increases in numbers these days. We're getting more population. Another elegant duck is the Northern Pintail. Uh, it has a bill that I call patent leather. Those of us of an age know, remember patent leather shoes. So um, it has this great tail feather on the males that is uh, like a long hat pin, if you will, and just gorgeous colorations. Look at those feathers, um, just beautiful. This duck it has a sense of urgency in the springtime. It's one of the first ones we see after the ice is melting on our lakes, and it's heading up to Canada to try to get the choicest spots for nesting up there. Um, it eats a little bit of everything, plant life and animal life, so that's to its advantage as well. I don't know if you can hear that. It makes some very strange noises. Only the mallards kind of quack. That's uh, all the other ducks make strange noises. Our next uh, uh, duck is a uh, American widgeon. And it used to be called a bald pate. There a lot of bird names have changed, some for political correctness, others simply because um, it was the turn, it was time to change names for people. I don't know what the American Ornithological Society does, but uh, changing names is one of them. You can see the nice cream color on the top that makes it look like a bald head. And pate, I believe, is an English term for uh, top of the head. And lovely colors here. The, the female, again, uh, a drab brown, but she's got a little bit of orange in her and that black tip on her bill, which makes her a little easier to identify amongst some of the other females that are out there. Um, they breed all across the North, northeastern United States and up into Canada. When they fly, though, they've got really pretty markings on their wings, uh, this black and white. And these are, if we got into a, if this was bird watching 101, I'd tell you all about the primary feathers and the secondaries and the coverts and stuff, um, which really, once you get into it, is really kind of fascinating to see how these um, feathers play into 
uh, breeding cycles and appearances and so on. A little duck, we have some small ones called teal. The green winged teal is one here that has already gone through our area. They don't like cold weather so much, so they're one of the first ones to come through. You can see the male um, with his a green stripe on his head on top of a cinnamon colored head. Uh, and the female, you can see a little bit of the green sticking out of the wings here. They, uh, they are definitely dabblers. Um, this picture on the lower left was taken in Arizona. Now they know how to spend the winter, don't they? Um, but the places they stay and the places we bird watch uh, in Arizona are where wastewater is put out onto shallow ponds to percolate back into the aquifer underground. And it's just loaded with ducks, um, all different kinds of ducks, as well as shorebirds and lots of other birds. If you find water out in the Western states, you're gonna find birds. The other, uh, the other teal that we see a lot of is blue winged teal. Um, they come through this area uh, only as migrants. They don't breed in our area. And the male has that lovely white crescent on its face, um, which makes him kind of easy. Again, the dull female, um, jumping ahead here, a dull female uh, because of breeding. So she's a little harder to identify. These, all these um, dabbling ducks are referred to affectionately as puddle ducks because they can launch into flight right from the surface of the water. They don't have to run along the water like a a swan or a, uh, a grebe or a loon before they can get airworthy. Um, the, the blue wings, as you can see here, this is a flight picture. It's a little serendipity to be able to catch all these. And there you can see the blue on the wings of all these blue wing teal. And if you were in, and if I was in an audience with you, I'd say, so what is this bird that's flying right here amongst them? And if you said a northern pintail, you'd be right. And it's got that long pin-like tail out here. Um, during the wintertime, the birds flock together. They hang out together. A lot of them are eating the same kinds of things. And so it's not uncommon to find groups of ducks of a different, different species in large groups of ducks. So another slide from one of my introductory talks is uh, here's all the females of the dabbling ducks, just to give you an idea how confusing they can be. But what a great shot. Now, this is not one of my photographs. Everything you see is my photography, but I do steal from the internet once in a while because I don't have a shot. And this one just shows so nice, the big wide bill. So thank you to Flickr for that picture. So that's the dabblers. The divers, now they go deep in the water. And there's a lumber of them and they are various sizes here. We'll start with the little buffle head. This is only about a 14 inch duck, kind of small like the, um, like some of the, uh, uh, the wood ducks and things that we have up in our area. I'm not getting every duck here because some of our ducks, like the wood duck, is a summer duck. It's not a migrating waterfowl for our area. But anyway, this is an active little diver. Uh, we see them throughout the winter here. Got great color on its feet. I, you know, sometimes they scratch and that's kind of cool. Uh, I would like to know what was going on over the next several slides, but um, I wish I had this as video, but it was just a series of snapshots of one male chasing another male. And because they're divers, they went under the water and that was all I saw of them. Uh, really cool, lots and lots of uh, buffle heads around here until the ice forms. A really handsome duck in my opinion is the canvas back. It's got that really deep cinnamon colored head. But look at the bill, it's like a ski slope, the way the forehead comes down and goes out with a lovely red eye and lots of white here. I'm giving you a lot of detail because the duck that's gonna follow is often confused with it. I throw this shot in and, and then if you were in a, in a group, I would say, why is this duck doing this? Um, and who knows really, um, I would say because it can uh, is really the reason I leave it in here. It may have an itch that it's scratching, but ducks and geese, um, waterfowl in general, have many, many more vertebrae in their neck than other, uh, other animals do, including humans. And the reason for that is, and this mallard demonstrates it here, this is another internet picture, I don't have something like this. There's a gland at the base of the tail called the uropygial gland, and it has oils in it. And the ducks and other waterfowl take their bill back there, get a little bit of that oil on their bill, and they work it into their feathers. 
and that helps to uh, help them float and to be somewhat waterproof. So there is a reason for all that neck and all this preening is, is probably the reason for that. So you saw the male uh, canvas back, this is a female. And this haze on here is not a, just a bad picture. It's actually, we have uh, um, coal fired coal plants here, uh, energy plants still on Northeast Ohio shoreline. And this is the last one that's in our area, uh, Avon Lake and it discharges warm water into Lake Erie in the winter. And if the air temperature is right, there's ice forming around it, you'll get a haze. And so that's what this is. But the female canvas back has that long sloping bill uh, and she's not as white on the back as the males. Uh, I mentioned about flocking together. This is what Cleveland area used to look like, but when one of the power plants along the Cleveland Lakefront at East 55th Street was operational, it's no longer there now. But the ducks that would come like crazy in the winter because this warm water also attracted a fish called the gizzard shad. And they love to eat gizzard shad, the diving ducks. So follow my pointer here. We have one, two canvas backs here. We have another canvas back here. And I don't see any other males in the group. But we have redheads and scop in this uh, mix, as well as great black back gulls back here, different ages and stages, and so on. This is what our lakefront used to look like. Um, now we have to travel further for that. Um, the, the canvas back is up here, along with, a, um, along with a redhead duck. This is the one that they get confused with. So redhead is our next species. I think they're really cool looking ducks, uh, but they, if you're a beginner birder, don't have to apologize too much as you get used to them. Uh, usually we spot a bird and we uh, say, oh, that's such and such because of one, one field mark. And a field mark could be the color of the head. So this is its cinnamon color again. And both of these ducks, the canvas back and the redhead have a cinnamon colored head. But as you can see, if you're looking closely, the bill is different, the back is different, and so on. So here's a, a little group here, a little closer up. Uh, these birds are notorious uh, for laying their eggs in other birds' nests, so kind of irresponsible parents, but um, that's their lifestyle and it seems to have worked for them. They do put their nests out on a, a floating mat of vegetation and they build it up from there. Uh, here's a head-on view. So. When I first took this picture and looked at it, uh, those fat cheeks and the robust appearance made me think of rugby players, small, compact, muscular little uh, people that like to chase around and bang into each other. So that's my impression of, of, uh, of redhead ducks. Ringneck duck is the next one. This actually is a picture from Phoenix, Arizona area. And for years I said, geez, you never see a ring on a ring neck duck. These should be called ring bill ducks because it's got a nice white ring around the bill. But this picture showed up in one of my talks and a gentleman pointed out, do you notice this little red ring right here? That's where it gets its name, ring neck duck. Uh, another beauty uh, with its uh, deep yellow eye, uh, females of the diving ducks are also brown for the most part and have this little white crescent on the base of their bill. This pond where I was, it's actually uh, uh, another wastewater area. Uh, they get, you can get right close. So it's amazing. Uh, the water was perfect. The lighting was perfect. And here's a male and female ring neck duck. My son took this picture and I give him credit. Uh, no, this was not black and white photography. This was just the color of the, the birds and the background that day on a drab day in Northeast Ohio. And we have a lot of that um, throughout our winter months. So <clears throat> uh, a super diver is the long tail duck. And these are really cool for a number of reasons. One is the male tail feathers are just beautiful here on these long tails. But these birds will molt their feathers three times a year. Most birds molt twice a year. And they do that to get rid of their, uh, their feathers that are kind of worn out and ragged that aren't as efficient for flight um, as they should be. And so um, this is a bird here on the, on the lower right that could be a female or a young of the year or a different molt. And they're just really very pretty. These birds can go down to 200 feet. This is the deep diver and get um, shellfish off the bottom. 
they breed way up on the Arctic Circle. Um, uh, so they're, they're quite interesting birds that they would come through our area. We only see a few of them every year and it's a special deal. Took a little sip to wet my whistle here. <clears throat> so um, long-tailed ducks. The common golden eye is another active diver and uh, you can see the, its beautiful golden eye. There's another bird way out in the Western States that you could find as a Barrow's golden eye. Uh, but this is the male and female that we see here. These are cavity nesting ducks. What I mean by that is they will use a woodpecker hole that um, from last year that a woodpecker created. And that's what they do. They fly into that. If you can imagine a duck laying its eggs inside a nest inside of a tree. And we have several of these ducks that do that. And uh, the common golden eye is one of them. Uh, here is back to Avon Lake Power Plant again. I don't know if you can see right here where my pointer is. This is the uh, leg of the duck swimming. We have uh, an invasive species uh, in Lake Erie called the zebra mussel. It's a filter feeder and it's been here for many years and it's filtered out a lot of the organisms in the water and we have this really deep clear water now that we that is not native to Lake Erie. Um, it's caused a lot of change to the environment, um, not necessarily for good, as many invasives do, but uh, um, we picked it up probably from the bilge of a large ship coming into the port of Cleveland. Um, we are guilty, too, from the United States of sending our species accidentally to other countries around the world as well. But these guys are um, typically seen out here in the winter. You can see the ice pack that's out just beyond the, uh, the warm water influence at Avon Lake there. So cavity nesting duck, kind of cool. When those babies leave the nest, sometimes they've got 30 or 40 feet to fall down to the ground before they head out to the water. Uh, mergansers are cavity nesting ducks. And we've got three of them here. We start with the hooded merganser. This is one we see um, on open water by the hundreds in our area during the winter time, as long as the water is open. They will use ponds. There's a few of them that nest here, but most of them go up into Canada. Um, uh, the males are very striking uh, with that crest and they'll push that up until it's almost straight up and down with a like a one quarter of a circle there. The female, uh, these two shots just show you how lighting can change photography. Uh, they really are the same color, but depending on how the light hits them, different times of day, different backgrounds and so on. These white feathers here are actually the secondary wing feathers that are showing up when she was uh, stretching her wings. Really cool ducks. Uh, I mentioned hybridizing earlier with the mallard. Well, the um, hooded merganser likes to hybridize occasionally with a uh, common golden eye. And here you see, uh, the, this is a hybrid here. It has the merganser bill a golden eye, the merganser crest, but the uh, golden eye, um, <clears throat> excuse me, markings here on the back. And I'll add one more picture to the mix so you can see this, this um, brown color through here below the wings on the body, and you see a blush of brown here. So this is definitely a hybrid cross, and it's a well-known hybrid cross. So it's not just like this is super, super rare. So these guys are cavity nesters. You can put uh, boxes out. They will take to wood duck boxes, if you're familiar with wood ducks. And if, uh, if you're up in the Northeastern United States, I heard you say something about Massachusetts. Well, uh, you might be able to get them to nest up there. The most common duck on Lake Erie in the wintertime though, is the red-breasted merganser. Uh, hundreds of thousands of them will winter on Lake Erie. Uh, the, the one characteristic of all three of these mergansers is these long bills with serrations in them. And that's to help them to catch fish and hang on to them. And the fish of choice, as I mentioned earlier, is the gizzard shad. So uh, <clears throat> we have a lot of them. They come into the uh, rivers sometimes when, uh, when the ice is on the lake. This is the Black River in Elyria, Ohio. And <clears throat> we have a mix of common mergansers and red breasteds. I don't know what was going on here, but it's three or four times while I was watching these birds, they just ran across the water, making lots of splashes, never took flight, and then calmed back down again and floated around. Um, and that was just wild. It was crazy. Um, the colors are beautiful on them. This, even this one, this is a, a young male 
not quite getting into his breeding plumage, just the darkness against the black, uh, against the browns here and the oranges and so on. And some people, I, I, if I was in a crowd, I'd ask you, what is uh, all this oily looking stuff on the surface? Uh, this is the Cuyahoga River. If you know anything about Northeast Ohio, that, uh, that was the river that caught on fire back in the 1970s because there was so many uh, petroleum pollutants on the surface. A train was going over a trestle and uh, it sent some of its sparks to the water and started the river on fire. But no, this is not pollution. This is the sun behind me when I'm taking this picture, reflecting on the awnings of buildings across the water, across the, the river. And that's the color of an awning coming back, reflecting on the water surface, making a very interesting palette. Uh, so we've got these uh, mergansers out here. They do something funny called um, uh, posturing. And let's see if this video works here. You hear the wind blowing, but watch these males. There's four males chasing a female. She postures a little bit. And this must be their way of saying, I'm pretty. Uh, and the boys are trying to say, I'm prettier. And you'll see in just a second here, they start doing more of this. The pressure for uh, finding a mate is pretty intense in nature. Turns around and now they're gonna all be bobbing up and down doing funny things. So we don't just look at birds and chalk them off on a list. We enjoy watching them, their behaviors, uh, the environment that they're in and so on. The third merganser we have is the common merganser. It's the largest and it needs the largest uh, hole in the trees too. Pileated woodpecker holes are, are um, favorites of that. But you'll also find these ducks um, going into a hole that was created when a limb of a tree fell out and rotted out and the woodpeckers opened it up a little bit and they can get inside there. They cannot create the hole themselves. They have to use the hole created by something else, either a woodpecker or uh, nature working on uh, working itself into a hole. So, <coughs> excuse me, they're the largest ones and they're also uh, the most northern of the mergansers. They, uh, they all come down here to winter though in uh, the Great Lakes area uh, for quite a while and then they'll go to the uh, coastlines as well. The female looks a lot like a female red-breasted except for her uh, nice white chin patch. And you can see this hundreds of yards away with binoculars. So there's two birds that uh, are very confusing. The scop, this is a greater scop. Uh, and then there's a lesser scop. And you say, oh, that looked like a go back here. So there's the greater scop. And forget about the color here so much as uh, the heads. This is characteristic of what we see and the lesser. So if you put them together, occasionally you see them. And again, this is, sorry for getting in the weeds with this. But this is a lesser scop and it has a little bit of a point right here where I have my laser pointer. And if you look at its bill, it's mostly bluish color with a little black tip. This is a greater scop and its head is rounded. It lacks that little point. And its bill is wider, as you can see over in this picture and has more of a black tip on it. If you're talking about splitting hairs, you got it. That's splitting hairs. But um, we actually like this kind of stuff if you're crazy birders like me and my friends. Uh, it's a deep diver. It eats a lot of fish. So uh, ruddy ducks, really cool little ducks here. And this is an Arizona shot again, because we've done some birding in Arizona, my wife and I. Um, this is the, uh, a male here in the front getting near its breeding plumage, has a blue bill and so on. In the background, just for identification, is a cinnamon teal. So you know I'm out west when you see that. That's a western bird. And a blue wing teal right here. But the ruddies, uh, we'll find them in rafts of hundreds uh, on Lake Erie. They do, um, uh, they uh, look very nondescript here, uh, the young of the year and the females, as we have uh, uh, seen before. Um, they are not uncommon to be preyed upon by peregrine falcons. So uh, the next shot I'm going to show you was taken a long time ago at quite a distance. And this is a cropped image here on the left. Here's our peregrine up here. And it cannot pick off these ducks when they're on the water. It's hoping to scare one of them to fly. But this is not their first rodeo. And at one point, every one of them dove under the water. So the peregrine had to take off and go find, uh, go find another duck somewhere else. 
But if they get one on the wing, they can they can knock it down and and uh, be able to uh, to kill it and eat it. Very aggressive birds. Uh, the last three ducks that we're going to talk about are the scoters, and these are ducks that are way out in the lake. So the images I have are not great. Uh, this is a black scoter. These are birds that uh, like to nest way up on the tundra as well, way up north. They dive down and they eat a lot of our uh, shellfish like zebra mussels and stuff like that off the bottom. We have surf scoters, which are kind of comical looking, the males. Uh, they have this funny uh, colors on the bill and at the back of their head is a rectangular white patch. The females are blend in with the other females um, of this species and they're kind of hard to, uh, to take as well. And finally, the white winged scoter. Um, this one's a little easier if it shows its white wing patch. You can see that this, this is actually just some of the feathers on the wing. Um, and this is a female or a young of the year. Females and young, young of the year birds of a lot of species, not just ducks, look very similar. And this is a male and it's a white mark on its, around its eye, it looks like a comma, like a grammatical comma. And um, that makes it easy to identify. You don't usually get close to them, but over there at the Avon Lake plant that day, one got a lot closer. And so I just include this hazy picture uh, to show what they look like up close. Okay, we're done with ducks and now we're moving into geese. And you may wonder why those chickens are there. Well, I use PowerPoint and it, uh, if you're cooked into the internet, it makes suggestions for you that might enhance your presentation. When I type the word geese in, this is what popped up. <clears throat> so yes, I know these are not geese, but I thought I'd throw it in just for a little humor here. So we start first with the rare and elusive Canada goose. Yeah, you, if you're not laughing now, you should. They have become very abundant uh, in all areas of, the, of uh, the Northeastern United States, not just Northeast Ohio, primarily because of uh, the presence of lawns, golf courses, um, agriculture, and so on. They uh, like to nest uh, in marshes on top of uh, muskrat mounds. You can see the little baby here in the corner, very cool. They do make a lot of noise, and so they tend to alert all the other uh, waterfowl and animals and birds in the area when something's awry, if a predator is getting nearby. So they teach this to their babies, and this one's practicing making noise already. They like to hybridize as well, and you see this, this one probably was uh, hybridized with a, some sort of a white domestic goose. Here's another um, one with a gray, lag, probably a hybrid with a gray lag goose, as is this one here. And they actually, these birds, these hybrids fly. They sometimes hang out in barnyards uh, still. The Canada geese will come and spend time there, take a little bit of uh, grain or whatever they might be feeding on too. There's 11 subspecies of Canada goose. Uh, and they really, they're primarily size differences and some habitat differences but the smallest of them is actually the cackling goose. And it's its own species right now. Uh, here's a cackling goose in the foreground. It's, it's the size of a duck. And if you don't believe me, here's a, um, a gadwall in the foreground and here's a cackling goose in the background. So they're very small geese, uh, very strange when you see them in uh, swimming amongst Canada's like this. Now they're very rare here in the East, but if you go out in the Western States, they're the dominant goose that you see. You'll see flocks of hundreds of them together. And when I was in um, Washington state a couple of years ago during the winter, we drove by and where we're used to seeing a flock of Canada geese in the field, there was flocks of cackling geese out there and nobody, uh, nobody thinks twice about it. The uh, snow geese are uh, a Western species that's very abundant again in the Western states, but we find ourselves seeing a few of them during the winter. Uh, as migrants. They've come off of the Arctic tundra. That's where they've had their babies and there are hundreds of thousands of them up there. So uh, again, <clears throat> populations are doing quite well. They have two different colors, uh, the morphs, they call them the um, blue goose, as we'll see, I think in another picture here and the white ones that we see, but they all have black wingtips. They, um, they like to graze on things. The characteristic on them, because they look similar to some other white geese, is their bill. And you see this black part of the bill, we call that a smile. 
It's kind of a wry looking smile, but it's a smile nevertheless. And here you see a couple of the dark face that uh, I found down in the county south of me one time when I was burning so anxious to get some of those pictures. The one thing they share in common with most of the other white geese is this the black primary wing feathers with a gray base on them. Uh, this is my favorite pond here in Middlefield, again, a water catch basin pond, and they were right next to each other, uh, these geese with, the, with all the ducks and everything else. They look similar to a, a goose called the Ross's goose. It's a little bit smaller, and it's got this diminutive little bill, funny looking bill, uh, a little rounded head compared to things. And <clears throat> those two species were right next to each other at that pond. And when I took this picture, I was so excited when I got home because it really shows the difference on how you identify a Ross's goose and versus a um, snow goose. You can see the smile in the background here of the snow goose. And you gotta have to imagine its head and neck is elongated where this there's a little round head here on the Rosses, a straight up and down bill, almost looks black and blue like it bruised itself there. Another occasional visitor in the wintertime is the greater white fronted goose, another Western species that's hugely abundant out there, but is a, a winter visitor to us. And they'll blend in with the Canada geese. Uh, in our area, and you can see the corn stubble in the background. They're, they're graze amongst there looking for any kernels of corn that, um, that might have been missed. So that's it for geese. We don't have a lot of geese compared to ducks. The next group is going to be the swans. And I thought I would continue this craziness with um, a picture that's not swans. So I would love to see that bird in person if it wasn't for so many insects out there. <laughs> So we only have a couple of uh, visiting swans, the tundra swan and the trumpeter swan. The mute swan, we're not going to show. It's, uh, it's the introduced species that you find in ponds sometimes. Quite beautiful birds, but very aggressive. And, um, and they run the native species out of their areas when they find them. But tundra swans, they're just starting to make their way through our area now. As the name implies, they breed up on the Arctic tundra. And their nests are right on the ground up there where it's near frozen. If you look to where their bill meets the eye, you can see it sort of meets in a bit of a point. And this picture here on the left shows it a little bit better. And I'm pointing that out because that's how we're going to tell the difference between this one and the trumpeter swan. Both of them, though, are big birds. This one's around 20 pounds, and they need a lot of runway, if you will, before they can take off. So they start flapping and moving forward, and it looks like they're walking across or running across the water when they do this. The trumpeter swans, uh, on the other hand, uh, a little bit bigger in the 25 pound range. That's quite a bird. That's a lot of bird. And if you look at its bill, uh, it almost totally encompasses the eye. And it's much more of a ski slope. Remember our canvas back from a while ago? This is even more of a straight uh, ski slope. Now, this bird is actually not so much a migrant. They've reintroduced them into Ohio several years ago. And they're taking off, but not hugely so. Um, but they will show up in the winter, so I added in here. Um, they're, uh, they have a characteristic sound, though, that is, uh, I hope you have your sound turned on. I like to, I like to say it sounds like a... A sixth grader learning how to play the trumpet, <laughs> but have, I have sixth grade uh, grandchildren, so that's why I use that as a point of reference. But they wanted to bring them back in Ohio, and so they introduced them several years ago, as I mentioned, put collars on them. Uh, these are just free-floating collars. They can move down and they can move up like this, and this is out at Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. Kept track of them. They breeded very successfully. Now we have lots and lots of them over there. And this is what one of their babies looks like when it gets a little bit uh, of equal size. It's drab coloration for the first several months before it turns white. And that's lovely American Lotus in the background here at uh, out at Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. So that's it for swans, just two of them, if you will. And now we're going to hit a strange group of birds. If you're not much of a birder, you're gonna say grebes, what the heck is that? Well, it's more like a loon than a duck. And the word grebe actually comes from the Greek, according to Cornell University, and it means feet at the buttocks. 
Uh, and you're going to see that here. These are great swimmers and divers. Um, uh, we have a few of them here. The horn grebe is the most abundant uh, during the winter time here. This is what it will look like as it gets into its breeding plumage in March and into April when a few of them are still hanging around. But this time of year, this is what we're looking at. Um, during the winter, a lot of birds change their plumage, not so much all the waterfowl, but the grebes definitely do. And um, it's kind of like you not having to go to work and getting dressed up. You can just put your jeans and a sweatshirt on. Well, they're pretty simple in, in the winter time with these drab colors. Uh, the white marking uh, sort of a straight line with a darker top of head. The eyes are incredible on all the grebes. You get a close up here. It's a red, red eye with a black pupil and surrounded by a gold ring. How cool is that? Their bill on the horn grebe is white, and you're gonna, I'm telling you that because the next one that we see occasionally he has just an all black bill. And if we can be anthropomorphic for just a minute, it can give you the evil eye. Well, it doesn't know it's giving you the evil eye, um, but just interesting how different perspectives of the bird. And this is where we see feet at the buttocks. So you see this bird diving into the water here, this horn grebe, and its legs are way in the back. If we had a mallard uh, picture here, the mallard's feet would be way back here. Um, the grebe's feet are way in the back and it really makes it a very efficient swimmer under the water. They uh, catch and eat lots of different kinds of stuff. Um, I missed that there, I'm sorry. Um, but um, they'll get it off, uh, they'll get things off. And I guess the sound here is what we had. Here's the ear greed. Um, So this is a point of uh, interest. It, I stuck with just my pictures. We don't see many out in the Western states. They're a very common bird. They have that crazy red eye again, but their bill is thinner and longer and it is not white tipped. Plus also their face uh, is much darker. And you see a horn grebe here at the top left where my laser pointer is, that marking of white and black. The horn grebe is not so much so it has some dull white spots in it. And it's got these crazy crests on it that make it stand out pretty much too. So if we find one of those, we are a hero when we let our friends know that there's a horn or an ear grebe at such and such a lake. Quickly running through the other ones here, we'll get a, a few red-necked grebes, another Western species that comes through. And when it's, here's one diving. And again, look at how far back the feet are on the body. But the most abundant that we have, um, and these sometimes will stay and breed in our area, so they're not 100% a migrant, is the pied-billed grebe. This is its winter plumage. Um, it's like a little chicken is what it reminds me of, but pied means two color. So this is the male in breeding plumage with a white eye line and you see the black band on its bill. That's where the name pied bill comes from. Um, they e eat a lot of stuff. Um, they eat a lot of crustaceans, but they'll eat frogs and they'll eat fish as well. And it's almost like too much, if you will. They have, the, uh, they eat so much crustaceans though that, um, they actually get all those sharp little edges of the shells and stuff in their, um, in their crop, in their gizzard area, and they're able to regurgitate that. They'll actually eat their own feathers sometimes to create a plug to catch that. And the juices that are digested from these fish and frogs and stuff go through that plug, but occasionally they'll regurgitate that plug and get rid of all that sharp stuff. Now, the next picture is maybe one of the cutest things I've ever seen, and this comes off the internet. Um, this is a baby uh, pied bill grebe, and that is just the most darling little thing I've ever seen. So thank you to the internet for that picture. Uh, the loons are the last one in this group, and here we have the common loon. Uh, it's the one that we see most frequently. It's a big bird and uh, makes beautiful sound. They sometimes have this different variations depending on their molts. They get a little bit of white here, but they too like big fish. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a crappie, one of the game fish here in Northeast Ohio. Quite good to eat, by the way. Uh, and the fish like them too, or the, the loons like them too. So that's it for those guys. Now I'm gonna quickly run through um, definite winter visitors here, the gulls. Um, I subtitled this lakes to landfills and fishermen to garbage men because uh, we find them on Lake Erie, but you'll also find the gulls at the landfill and they're picking through the garbage looking for food to eat. They are definitely opportunists. 
They are not shrinking in numbers. There's plenty of them out there. Uh, some of them are very good fishermen, but they can also be garbage men. And I'm being negative there, but you might say that that's a success thing. They're opportunists, and that allows them to be in great numbers. This is what our lakefront looks like in the dead of winter. Uh, there, this is along the Cuyahoga River, and a ship had just come through, and all these gulls are following it because it's stirring up the, the water behind it, and the shad are getting chopped up by its propeller, and they're just diving in there to eat it. Our two most abundant gulls, uh, if you're a gull person, are the ring-billed gull here on the left and the herring gull on the right. <clears throat> a little bit of size difference, but they need to be standing next to each other to identify them. The bill is different, as you can see the ring, black ring on the ring bill and an all yellow bill on the herring gull, and the legs are different. Um, yellowish green legs on the ring bill and pink legs always on uh, the herring gull. We also have some Bonaparte skulls. Uh, they have a, a black head during their breeding plumage, but this is the only one we see in the wintertime, a white head with this black spot behind the eye. And here's one of those gizzard shad that uh, all the waterfowl, the ducks and the gulls are eating during the wintertime. We will see greater black back gulls and lesser black back gulls on the ice along our lakefront during the winter. These are birds of the North Country as well. Uh, spend most of the year way up north uh, around the Arctic Circle and uh, off of Newfoundland and places like that. Uh, the black on the back can be misleading, uh, trying to identify the two species. So we like to look for the size. The black back, the greater black back is much larger. And the lesser it has a little bit of dullness to its black, but sometimes that's hard to tell. And the legs, that's key. If we can get them on the ice, we've got it because lessers always have yellow legs and graders always have pink legs. So two gulls that we see that are kind of hard to, to uh, find every year are the little gull, which looks like a Bonaparte's, but underwing is just black. And when it flies, it goes black and white, black and white, black and white as it's flying, very easy to spot. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll get them, but when they come there, the word goes out to the birding community, there's a little gull at such and such a place along Lake Erie and people flock there, sorry for that pun, to get to see it once a year. Also the Sabin's gull, which is usually a very all white gull in its juvenile plumage like this, it, I think it's just a beautiful bird. Uh, you can, you know, I don't have to describe it, you can see it. So when you find one of those, that's a, that's a special thing too. They generally stay much further north. You'll find these birds, both of these probably up closer to um, the Niagara Falls area, the Niagara River and places like that. And we have white gulls, um, the immatures that we typically see. Uh, this is a Glaucus gull here on the left. This is one of our largest gulls. The greater black back gull is the largest of the gulls, but this Glaucus gull comes pretty close and an Iceland gull. So um, they, they have a little bit of coloration in their plumages, both of them, but we look to the bill for identification here. And you can see the yellow base with a black tip on the Glaucus and pretty much an all black bill on the Iceland and a much shorter bill as well. Now, sometimes we rarely see the adults, but here's an adult Glaucus. Now this bird is 26 inches long versus 17 inches for our uh, very abundant resident ring neck, uh, ring billed gull. And the leg color is different as well. If this bird were to flap its wings, you would see no black at all. Just the gray on the mantle, if you will, the top of the wing and all the rest of it is white. So it's one of the white gulls, um, very cool looking. So that's it. We got 52 minutes into this. Uh, there are other winter birds here. This is not the, these are not the only ones, but uh, I know attention span, if you're not a birder, can uh, wane here a little bit. So I'm gonna stop sharing right now. And uh, Danielle, if there are any questions in the chat or anybody wants to pipe in and, and ask a question or two, I'm, I'm open to making up an answer. No, <laughs> if I don't know, I'll tell you, I don't know. Sounds good. We do have a couple of questions here. Uh, so the first one is, um, is there any evidence that the two, the two scop species hybridize? I don't know. <laughs> I don't. That's not something we worry over too much because it's hard enough to tell one from the other without real good characteristics. So when you find something that's in between, it very well could be a hybrid. 
but uh, that's not something that um, is talked much about in the birding, uh, the, the popular birding books that we have. Um, it may be in the technical literature for the ornithologist, but the, uh, uh, the hobbyists like myself, uh, we don't see that kind of information typically. That makes sense to me there. I, I was surprised at how close um, they are to each other. So, all right, let's see. Um, another one is climate change threatening the migratory patterns of the birds that we see um, commonly in the Cleveland area. Yes, uh, and what we're seeing is some of the birds that typically, and now we're walking away from waterfowl here. The waterfowl pretty much are doing their, their usual thing. They're, they've not been affected much yet. But um, in the songbird category, we're seeing birds that are more common in the summertime to areas south in Ohio, for example, below Columbus that are starting to inch their way up into Northeast Ohio. Um, and birds, but the birds that we worry most about are the ones that need the cold weather and the colder climates and it's getting warmer the further north you go. They don't have any further north to go. They're gonna lose habitat up there. So. Um, uh, we worry about that. Uh, the changing climate, um, everything in, in nature is inextricably tied together. So as the climate has warmed, some of you may be aware that um, there's a beetle, a pine beetle out in the western states that has invaded the pine uh, forests out there. And there's huge numbers of dead trees that are out there now. That seriously is affecting some of the birds like the Clark's nutcracker and and other birds like that. Um, so as it warms, the insect population starts moving north. Um, in our own lawns last year, I'm also a, a master gardener volunteer. Um, we had infestations of army web worms up here, army worms rather, army worms. And what happens is in the, in the summer, the warm storms, and we had a lot of them in 2021, they brought these moths that lay the eggs they brought them up with them on the storms. They laid their eggs in the late summer, they hatched and it's caterpillars and they will kill a lawn in a matter of a few days. They'll just eat the roots gone. Oh, wow. uh, it's pretty amazing. So um, yes, climate, uh, the changing climate is affecting things and uh, the insects, the plants, the soils, uh, the temperatures, everything is inextricably tied together. And we talk about birds, but it's all about the habitat. It's about the plants. It's about the pollinators. Um, the songbirds that are here in the summertime are here because of our abundant caterpillar populations in our trees primarily. So as people cut down more trees, uh, we have fewer, um, fewer caterpillars. As more invasive species displace native species, both in plants and in animals, uh, it reduces the amount of native food. So. It's a whole talk unto itself. Plants to birds. That's uh, that's another one, but it's uh, that's where I bring both of my interests in gardens and plants together with the wildlife and stuff together. It's um, we really Absolutely. do. Yeah, we need to we need to be doing as much as we can or supporting the people who are doing it um, to help take care of the environment. Yes. So this next question um, seems to go right along with this uh, topic. Do we know the relative impact of natural environmental factors versus conservation efforts, such as water impoundments on current population size of duck and other waterfowl population? They do population studies and there, there's um, a Cornell University in concert with the National Audubon Society years ago created this huge database called eBird. And it's a citizen science database. So when I go out birding and all of my friends, we have an app on our phone that allows us to uh, make a checklist of, of the species that we're seeing and how many we're seeing and add comments whenever appropriate. And they're using that database to determine changing populations. And it's only been in existence since roughly around 2010, so a dozen years or so, but already papers are being written about it and um, numbers of, of birds being seen. One example that I, I know for sure it was published in the eBird News is out in, the, in California, um, some of the farmers have fields that they could leave flooded during times of the year and other times not. Well, the migrating shorebirds from the Arctic Circle need to have wetlands to land in to rest where they can refuel by eating some of the uh, the bugs that live along the mud and in the mud and stuff like that. 
they saw the numbers were decreasing. They went to the farmers, asked them if they could consider flooding their fields during a very specific time of year, a number of weeks. And when they did that, the numbers of birds that were able to stop and, and rest and fuel up again, if you will, by eating, increased dramatically. And then the farmers can drain the fields again. It's only these small windows for migrants that make a difference. It's, it's like having a road from, you know, a, a, a 2000 mile road that keeps having holes in the road and you can't make it past the holes. That's what we disrupt the habitat or we fragment the habitat. Um, we, I have a picture in another talk that I give that shows what the forests looked like 300 years ago in Ohio. And basically Ohio was all forests. And that's a huge, a huge block of habitat. And it's varied within it, but still it's all forests. And then I showed what uh, the area looks like today primarily, and you have mostly agricultural fields out in our rural areas mm -hmm. with fragments, little blocks of forest. Well, those little mm -hmm. blocks aren't enough to make a difference. So we fragmented this, uh, the environment and it's the numbers. That, that's why you saw, if you saw the thing that made the popular news where we have 30 billion less birds now than we did 25 mm -hmm. years ago. And it's primarily because we have changed the environment and and again they need they need all these stop off points northern shore of lake erie from toledo all the way to erie pennsylvania is a perfect stop off for migrating shorebirds as well as water birds and and the summer birds like the warblers that's another talk warbler warm-up uh, they stop there because they're flying north they fly at night they see the edge of lake erie and they say, okay, I've been flying all night. I'm gonna stop in this habitat that's right here on the edge of Lake Erie, feed during the day, rest. And then they pick up about 8.30, 9 o'clock at night and they go back up high and they continue across Lake Erie now nonstop to Point Pelee and, and all these types of things. So it's, it's fascinating. It's, uh, it's so wonderful to see when good things happen and so challenging to and frustrating to see when things don't happen well or people just, but only money first. Developing is, is the biggest thing. We need places to live, but when we strip a cornfield and put in houses, we need to get in there. And, and our Audubon chapter and many others are doing this. We need to go in there and say, don't just plant lawn. Let's plant native plants. Let's put a few oak trees in here, which is the best tree for caterpillars in the United States is oaks. Um, there's a, a guy who's doing a lot of talks. If you will Google Doug Tallamy, T-A-L-L-A-M-Y. He's an entomologist out of the University of Delaware. And he's got this thing called Homegrown National, National Park. He's trying to get people to reduce the amount of lawn, replace it with native vegetation. And that's going to be good for insects. It's going to be good for birds. It's going to be good for sequestering carbon from the air because you need plants to do that. Um, it's all inextricably tied together. You can't pull it apart. <laughs> it's just yeah. pull one thing out and everything falls apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's funny you say that. My entire front yard is a garden. Um, I don't have any grass. God um, bless you. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. I have trees everywhere. Um, and I just I'm in the I'm in the suburbs. I don't have a huge you know huge lot or anything. But I did that years ago, and I have a lot of birds. I have a lot of you know animals that come over. I even mm -hmm. have had a, a pair of mallards uh, come over and nest in my yard um, because I have a pond a couple a couple houses down. So yeah, it's amazing what um, just a little bit of change to your yard can do uh, yeah, for, and for if, the wildlife. Um, and if you're familiar with the term tree lawn, it's that oh, little yes. bit of lawn between the curb and your sidewalk. Yeah. Um, I have a wonderful picture in my plants for birds uh, thing that I pulled off the internet where this little cottage of a house had a white picket fence along the sidewalk and all this beautiful plants and small shrubs and trees uh, behind it. And their tree lawn was a garden of, of native plants. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can do this. And if you say, oh my gosh, a lot of work, a lot of work initially, but perennial plants are yeah. less work in the long run because they don't, you don't have to get in there and weed like you do the annuals and, and yeah. vegetable gardens. And I do all that stuff. Uh, but they, they get in there and they make a solid thing and you leave them up in the fall for the birds and the insects mm -hmm. that nest in the stems of those perennial plants. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's yep. all good. <laughs> it is. It is. All right. I think we have another question here. Um, what's the status of avian flu in Ohio? Um, it's primarily a, um, uh, 
an agricultural problem with our turkeys and uh, laying hens, from what I understand. I just listened to the agricultural report on Spectrum this morning, channel one for us up here, and they do an ag report every uh, Friday morning. So um, there's it, we don't see it in the bird populations as much. We did years ago, we had birds dropping like crazy and they had us be sending, uh, pick them up in plastic bags and get them to the agriculture department. There was avian flu hitting those birds, but we haven't seen much of a problem in the area where I live. I don't know elsewhere in Ohio what to say to it. That's good. Um, Michael made a comment, many communities prohibit anything but grass on tree lawns. Uh, he says that should change. Agreed, um, I am not allowed to have anything but grass on my tree lawn. So uh, yeah. my tree lawn does have a, a strip of grass up and then the whole front yard is, is garden. But yeah, absolutely. I know here in Columbus where I live, they they put a lot of restrictions on what you can put on your tree lawn. So. It yeah, and that's is. where education comes in. Um, the people that are doing that are is, is probably good reasons for it because actually that's right of way. I think for the city, they own a certain amount of that berm, but um, uh, but still, there's the rest of your yard. It's everything on the other <laughs> side of the sidewalk exactly. to the house. So uh, and it can be quite beautiful. People will be envious of you if you just take an area, make a butterfly garden, which is just a circle or a, a scallop type of a thing and throw some plants in. And you can go to the National Wildlife Federation website. I think it's nwf.org. And they'll tell you what native plants are good for your area. There's actually a plant finder. So that's nationalwildlifefederation.org. And um, if you don't know what they are, you can get them. Lots of nurseries anymore are getting on the bandwagon and providing more native plants. Yes. Uh, when you get a big showy rose, and why, why natives versus other ones? You can... You can have all the other plants, but you need to add native plants for the insects. If you have a big showy rose that's got 100 petals in it, the insects can't get to the pollen. And that's what they're after, the pollen or the nectar. So these big complex flowers that we have and um, uh, that they don't do the insects any good. Put some of them in there, but then put some simple roses in there too, the old fashioned roses where you can see the stamens and the anthers and the pistils, everything in the middle of them. Um, that's all, that's what the bugs need and the bugs need them and we need the bugs for the birds and we need the bugs for honey. Uh, we need bees, native bees, only uh, the bees don't bother you. Um, they really don't. And most of them are solitary that we see. And if you plant, just take a 10 by 10 patch or four, I have a garden that's series of garden beds. There's a four foot by 10 foot bed that I just seeded with two packs of wildflower seeds that were given away at a park. And that patch now has so many insects in it uh, when the flowers are blooming and they bloom from early spring until the fall. And you just see a, just an incredible array of insects and none of them are bothering you. You may see bone set is a nice plant that can really take over. Um, there'll be four or five species of, of sweat bees alone, little bees about that big that will uh, be inhabiting them. And they're just going to town. And then you'll see a wasp come in and try to get one of the sweat bees because that's a predator, a predator right. insect. So you have predator right. prey at all levels. Yeah. Anyway, amazing. you're getting me off and I can go on and well, on. We, we, might have to, we might have to have you back for a talk on that. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll do another coffee hour some other time. Well, if there are no other questions, I certainly um, thank you, Matt, for joining us today. And thank you for everybody uh, for, for joining us for the, the talk today. And um, hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.